Coming up, the world's first blind and deaf athlete to complete the Badwater 135 Ultra Marathon and how he overcomes challenges in life. If you're new here, we help service members and veterans achieve financial freedom. We have a free Facebook community with over 60,000 people, a free podcast, which you're listening to right now. Make sure you subscribe and leave us a review if you like, got something out of it a free YouTube channel, and then for those who are looking to take it to the next level, we also offer the War Room Mastermind Group. Now, today's guest, Aaron Hale, lost his sight, and then several years later, his hearing as well, from an IED blast while serving as an e Army EOD technician. Now, he owns and operates EOD Fudge. They build badass tactical aprons, and they have delicious fudge and other desserts, and He's building a real estate empire on the side for shits and giggles, because, you know, why not? In this episode, we cover his incredible story, and then Aaron gives us the simple yet profound secret to how he overcomes challenges in life in order to come back swinging harder and faster than ever before. So you're in for a good ride. This is a great episode. Aaron's a friend, a member of the War Room Mastermind, and an all-around incredible human. So without further ado... Here he is. And we're back with Aaron Hale, the Navy and Army veteran, gone endurance athlete and a fudge maker. I don't know what you would call a guy who owns a fudge company. There's probably a better word than fudge maker. Chef extraordinaire. And uh, Aaron, what's up, man? How are you? What is up? David Brosen Perry. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad to, uh, glad to be back on, man. It's been a long time, but, you know, we've been, we've been you know, talking you know, these few years and hanging out. I love, it's, it's cool to be back on the show. Yeah, it's great. I, we were just talking right before the show. So for anyone listening, Aaron Hale came on in November of 2019. And at the time he had like a house. I can't remember. I, I didn't listen to the whole episode again, but I can't remember for sure if he is buying his first house in that episode or just closed on his first deal but he'd come a long way in the last few years and so wanted to get him back on the show and talk about that and then also i want to hear about his uh i want to hear about your 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 most recent running adventure because you're nuts but wow. and, you know for I, I guess if you consider the fact that i'm totally blind and totally deaf except for this <laughs> one uh, cochlear implant uh most of the stuff I do, including, you know, having identical twin toddlers is, is crazy. But yeah. Uh, uh, I think most of the stuff that, you do would be crazy if you weren't blind and deaf. I mean, how many people showed up to the Badwater 135? There may be 200 people tops. You know what? I got to Death Valley to run that 135 miles across, across the desert and up Mount Whitney. Um, and it was so funny. I step out of my hotel room in Furnace Creek, is like the national park in Death Valley. People actually go there to like see it. And it's so blazing hot. And everybody's like, oh my God, that's hot. And I'm thinking, man, I live in Florida. This is dry heat. Yeah. You should check out, you can check out my uh, garage. I remember reading your post about when you basically murdered your treadmill. It, it quit on you, right? Right before the race. Say that again. Your treadmill quit on you right before the race, didn't it? You just ran it into the ground. Oh my gosh. I mean, even before the race, you know, the, the race, um, we do so many things and so many things with that, 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 uh, ultra marathon for one, uh, I am guided by somebody and for the last 10 years, I've been running side by side with a, with a, with a wing guy using a little tether in between us. We just hold on to, you know, something. And yeah. I, I run like shoulder to shoulder with a person. And we find out that it's single track. The entire 135 miles, I could run be a single file. I got it. We had to come up with an entire new guiding system for me using trekking poles and a waist belt and duct tape and 550 cord just to, so I could run behind a person. And it actually worked out really well, better than the side by side thing. It was cool. Huh. I wonder why they have that rule. Like that seems interesting that they would say you can't run side by side. You have to go single file. 
Well, there's there's about half a dozen governing agencies covering the national park, the highway, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and you know, the state, the state, you know, county officials and all that. And they said, if you want to have an ultra, you want to have a race on this road, uh, your runners cannot cross that white lane, the white line. So I had most, and, and most of the runners, they run right on the white line because their shoes start melting on the blacktop. Mm-hmm. And I had from the white line to the end of the pavement, which is a, maybe a foot and a half. And then it's a scream and really a loose pad of dirt. So, uh, it, it, it can't, you just can't do it shoulder to shoulder, side by side. And you are the first ever blind and deaf athlete to finish that race, correct? That's right. Man, that's intense. I mean, the fact that you're running races at all is intense but i remember when you started doing the ultras and you were like i'm gonna do a 31 and i'm gonna do a 50 i'm gonna do 100 and then you got a slot for bad water and i just remember just thinking like there's no way i have done some endurance running and i have no desire at all to run bad water and for anyone listening who doesn't know bad water the 135 miles through death valley is to my knowledge as a person who's not run it one of the it might be the hardest but it's one of the two or three hardest ultra runs in the in the world right there are there are a few few majors um the uh, the, the marathon de Saab, um, marathon on the sand in morocco mm. is a five day five six day stage race across the sahara they also claim to be the world's toughest foot race um then there's like the hurt 100 the stuff yeah. David Goggins talks about in his you know, books. Um, I've, I've cycled the first 10 miles of the Hurt 100, and that's no joke. To just so, straight up. The, the thing about, uh, about bad water is just, it's, it's heat, and there are three, basically three mountain climbs to do. And, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, pretty, it's really brave. Yeah. And you finished it because you're a stud. And uh, I don't know. What are your thoughts now that you've done it? What's next? Oh man! Now I'm um, I'm looking. I'm actually looking for another race. I'm taking a little time off, focusing on the business, focus businesses, okay. and focusing on the family. It, it ultras really do take a lot of time to train. Yeah. It's a it's a, it's a big. Um, uh, it, it's a big responsibility just getting ready and it took a lot of my attention. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've done two half Ironmans and then I didn't complete it, but I trained for a full Ironman and it's, you know, that's 14 to 18 hours a week that you're training and that's not anywhere near as intense as when you're running. I mean, you, at one point you were probably running a hundred miles a week plus, right? Oh, uh, I was doing anywhere from like 70 to... Oh, no. It depends. You have like taper weeks and you know mm-hmm. rest it, rest times. But yeah, uh, my biggest biggest weekend I did one hundred miles over three days, and, and that was my my peak training. Uh, yeah. And that was that, that that doesn't have that wasn't it was also running during the week, but uh, uh, you know, maybe an average anywhere from between say fifty and seventy miles. Man. Yeah. And for anyone listening, Aaron runs on a treadmill in a sauna in his, in his house, essentially in Florida. And, uh, and I, I laugh cause I've seen him posting about breaking his treadmill before. And I'm like, man, but I mean, the fact that you run with a guide and you have to do all of this is nuts. But you know, the irony there is that almost every race, I, I try my best to get out and run on the road with with a friend and actually train um real road miles because treadmill miles just don't don't equate they're not the same and mm-hmm. i've really gotten punched in the face you know, when getting to the actual race after training entirely on a treadmill uh it's is you really having an inflated sense of my abilities and um 
and then totally underestimating the hills and potholes. And, you know, because when I lost my hearing, I also lost my, my vestibular balance, my inner ear balance. And uh, it, we get our balance three different ways. Uh, inner ear, uh, sense of sight, and being able to, you know, see ourselves in relationship to the world. And uh, through touch, actually, con physical contact, our nerves and, you know, sensing. Yeah. Uh, so if anybody's counting, I'm missing two of the three. And um, on a treadmill, like on a treadmill, you don't get to use the muscle groups that you use. Mm -hmm. that you would need to balance. So I get out on the, on the road and I'm using one of those, I guess, three-dimensional muscles right you know different directions and trying to stabilize myself on the treadmill i don't really need that and then i get on the road and it kicks my butt uh, but bad water was really ironic um i did a lot of the training in my closed garage and most of it was just walking with a weight vest and some crazy incline on my treadmill because uh when I got to Badwater, the toughest parts were those hill climbs. And for the most part, it was just, it was like a couple minutes walking, a couple minutes running, a couple minutes walking, a couple minutes running the entire way. And um, it was the weight vest and the walking on the treadmill that, you know, in, in that Florida humidity that made Badwater achievable it wasn't uh, running on the, it wasn't really running on the road which i didn't actually do a whole lot of interesting that's huh yeah there's a lot that goes into endurance stuff that people just don't understand and i've only done a little a little bit of stuff but like the nutrition and everything else just i mean it's everything's got to be so fine-tuned to complete 135 miles and that's that's a pretty awesome feat and we could probably fill the whole show talking about that, but I want to hear your real estate journey. I want to hear a little bit about that. I mean, you bought a house on the last podcast, and I know you've done a lot more since then. So let's let's hear what you got going on. Well, I made the I made the podcast the first time around by a you know a blind deaf guy actually buying a house, uh, <laughs> and I tell you what that man that was like you know, the the crucible you know that was the gauntlet it was the very first one and everybody says you know that that first one is the learning that's real estate university what we did and we okay i'm blind and deaf and i decide i want to go with a burr strategy and to find a deal i went to an online auction to buy it use it and i want it was hard money Online auction, brr, <laughs> out of state. And, and it turned out just like you would imagine. This is a catastrophe. Uh, so, but we were actually buying in a place I was familiar with, my hometown. I had a family there. My mom and my brother had done a couple flips. And uh, we had a, a great contractor as a freaking magician. Plus, we also had the market. This is 2019. It was really in our favor. So uh, what ended up happening, we bought this uh, property. Oh, yeah. And um, <laughs> really big, uh, but simple learning point. Uh, you know, hard money lenders, they want to lend to entities, not people. And so don't buy, you know, don't get under contract with the auction house uh, with your own name. Because they they don't want to change the contract, and a hard money isn't going to give you the money, and we had us go go with our own cash. Thank goodness we had a, you know a decent reserve, but we didn't have enough to get it across the finish line. So we also learned how to find a private money lender, you know, to to get the job done. Also, uh, even if you do manage to do hard money, you know, lending with on an auction, the hard money lenders want to, going to want to see enough reserves for at least the purchase price. So yeah. lesson learned. <clears throat> but what happened was we bought, a one, or we bought it at $65,000. 
we budgeted fifty thousand dollars for the renovation and estimated it to come out to uh, one sixty five on the uh, ARV uh, yeah. uh, after renovation. What actually ended up happening was the renovation ballooned to one hundred thousand dollars because it was built in nineteen thirty. Uh, had termites living oh. as tenants. Um, a, so it was dry. The roof leaked and everything. I think the um, the roof was just being held up by the you know hundred year old wallpaper uh, on the walls. <laughs> It was uh, every time, every time the contractor pulled back a board, they found some new surprise. Anyways, uh, uh, so if, if you're, you know, if you guys are doing math, $100,000 rehab, $65,000 purchase price, I'm already at 100% ARV. And we, we needed to borrow about $25,000 for a private letter to get the whole thing completed because we were out of it. Uh, our own cash reserves. But what happened was, uh, you know, we were off on other things like our, uh, our, our appreciation value. And that ended up being somewhere around uh, $200,000. Oh. We did it and rented it for almost $250 and more than, uh, per month than we thought we could. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So, we did cash out refinance. We pulled out almost all of our, our, uh, seed money, uh, paid back the, uh, private money lender with some interest. And then we, uh, started buying some more properties. We bought another single family uh, with the intent of turning into a midterm rental. It was a four bedroom. It was a five bedroom, one bath. We converted it to a, uh, four bedroom, two bath. And we wanted to rent, rent it by the room to traveling nurses. We couldn't get anybody to take, uh, apparently they don't like, they didn't like sharing bathrooms. Mm. So we turned it into a short-term rental and that has been a cash cow in Akron, Ohio. It's impressive. It was like a secondary tertiary market, but there's, uh, campuses or satellite campuses of 12 universities within half an hour. There are three major, uh, hospitals. There's. All right, there's so many points of interest and so many, so much transient. It's, it used to be the, the rubber capital of the world. That's where the headquarters of Dow Chemical, uh, BF Goodrich, Firestone are all right there, still in Akron, Ohio. Uh, so there's, there's lots of commerce going on. Uh, so we get, we get plenty of rentals. Nothing has been, been doing great for us the last few years. We bought a duplex, originally turned that into a long term rental, but we're converting that into a midterm rental since, uh, you know, one tenant can have one bathroom on each side. And we, we bought another, uh, Airbnb short-term rental, just three doors down from the first one. And that one's been running for enough, about a year also and doing equally as well. Uh, since then, you know, my wife and I, we, we live in Florida while doing all of this. And, uh, about two years ago, I partnered with a fellow wounded friend of mine, Dan, uh, Devine, who had just retired from the Navy out of Pensacola. And we started an acquisition company sourcing off market deals to either, uh, assign to other investors or you know, flip ourselves or you know, do the burr strategy right here in Florida and keep it in our own portfolio. And we've got currently three projects underway in various states of completion, uh, in the panhandle between Panama city and Pensacola. Man. So you've been busy. What's that? You've been busy. I try to keep busy, not to mention. I've got my own podcast and I'm a stay at home dad with three boys that eat way too much, break too many things and are getting big, big ass. And you run an like entire run. separate company on the side too. Mm. We haven't oh, even yeah. talked about EOD fudge yet. Yeah. Well, that backing up before that first home purchase, yeah, when I, I went, I went blind in 2011. 
and it was an IED blast. I was working as an EOD technician, explosive ordnance disposal, the military is a bomb squad, um, in Afghanistan. I got, I got blown up and I lost my eyes, cracked my, my skull in a couple of places. and was like a spinal fluid right out my nose. Uh, I got patched up, but I also got handed my, my pink slip and were medically retired. And then that's when I started running and doing all sorts of other adventure stuff. Started speaking cross country. Yeah. And, uh, I was, I was, I was doing okay as a blind guy. And in fact, 2015, early 2015, I ran my first Boston marathon. I'd climbed three 14ers in Colorado on the same day. I was yeah. kayaking, uh, rapids on the Yellowstone river. Um, even when hunting here. Uh, you see that guy up in the corner there. I shot that guy uh, uh, without watching. Um, and everything was going pretty well. That's until pretty cool. How do you 2000? Yeah, we, 2000. Can't, we can't just graze past that. How do you shoot an animal without being able to see? Uh, that's another story. But okay. um, it, it took, uh, um, I took, it was teamwork. Okay. Uh, I had one of those, uh, uh, IR dot scope type things, a, a really good spotter spotters. And that's, they, they kind of, they, they talked to me on the target. That's uh, awesome. But it's actually a pretty cool story, but, uh, um, oh, fast forward just a couple, couple months into, you know, just mid, mid, late summer about this time in 2015, uh, there was cracks in my skull, which the doctors tried to patch, I guess. Uh, weren't totally patched, and mm -hmm. I I contracted meningitis, and uh, it put me back in the hospital. It almost killed me. In the during the process, it took my hearing and my balance, and I came home in a wheelchair, totally deaf, totally blind. And I did uh, exactly what somebody in my situation would do. I started a fudge company. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking. Not like sit around and feel sorry for yourself. No, we'll start a company. <laughs> no, that was, that was it. I was sitting around feeling sorry for myself. I was like, man, lightning striking twice. Yeah. I was mean, just like, it was re I was really pissed off. I was thinking, yeah. when have I paid my dues? When, you know, like, when have I had my fair share? Give this to somebody else. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I've been, I've been, I've been speaking. You know, around the country, uh, telling and talking to people about the success through struggle and triumph over tragedy and all that. And it was like, you know, the, the ironic joke, uh, I was thinking somebody up there is saying, you know, put your money where your mouth is, do it again. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, sure. <laughs> but it was, it was like, that was the right thought, you know? Yeah. I've been talking, talking the talk. I needed to walk the walk, and I needed to do it again. And uh, the, the the holidays were were coming up, and so I put all of my effort and basically my this all this emotional energy right into Thanksgiving prep and cooking. And I started making all these desserts, and it just piled up because I had a lot of emotional energy going on, and I just kind of poured it into the fudge fudge making and and it, you know one thing led to another and all of a sudden we had this this fudge company extraordinary delights or eodfudge.com and that's what you know the the that that pretty much it took off in a couple of years it was doing pretty well and that's where we got our our seed capital you know that our investment capital to start getting into real estate and that was culinary arts, you know, cooking. That's definitely a passion of mine. I love it. I love being you know, an entrepreneur. I love cooking. Uh, I definitely love to eat. Um, and, but I, it was something, it was, it was like a art therapy. And I really have a, a passion for real estate and entrepreneurship and, and just uh, everything about real estate is, is fun and it's exciting. I know real estate, I don't know if anybody really refers to it as exciting, but 
um, it's a challenge. It's another challenge for me. And yeah. if you haven't noticed, I like my challenges. I, I have noticed. So, okay. So you start your fudge company and almost by accident. So for people who don't know, um, Aaron was a cook in the Navy before he transitioned into the army and went EOD. And so he was revisiting some, some passions and started his company. And when he says it took off, uh, Aaron has been on the Rachel Ray show before as well as quite a few other places. Um, and then he was, you were selling, uh, you were selling tactical aprons. <laughs> For sale now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Go to the gear. Uh, there's a apparel link. Uh, yeah. I think it all flows some of those things. Oh, um, I'll give you guys a discount, but, uh, the, the cool, uh, aprons. I love it. In fact, I wore, wore my tactical apron for every episode of our TikTok, you know, channel, Aaron handles cooking without looking. Hey. Yeah. Uh, it all, you know, it definitely started as a, as a Navy cook. And then I switched to army bomb squad because of course, um, you know, once I got my first confirmed kill with a cheesecake, I decided to start <laughs> saving lives instead. Aaron's um, also can... an unofficial comedian. If you've, <laughs> if you've never had a conversation with Aaron, you... <laughs> he's one of the funniest guys in the world. And um, it's always a pleasure. RMFP rolling my fake eyes. <laughs> but, uh, uh, where was I? I'm all over the place. Sorry, uh, we were talking about, I, uh, uh, aprons. You can call and... me. I was going to say, I'm both Navy and Army, so you can call me a Army soldier. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still working through the RMFE world in my big It's That's awesome. I'm oh, getting the t-shirt. My favorite still is the time that we were at, uh, we were at Flip Hacking Live, and I had, I had ordered, a, gotten a, a round or two of drinks for everybody, and I'm in the bathroom. And Aaron walks up to the urinal, urinal next to me and yells, damn ATM won't take my money. <laughs> it was just, he didn't know it was me next to him. He had no idea. I was like, that's hilarious. What's, what's, what's even more uncomfortable is if I'm standing right next to, well, what's really uncomfortable is that I try to share, uh, accidentally share a urinal with somebody else. But, uh, it's totally inadvertent. But, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll step up to, you know, one of those urinals, one of those dolls, and I'll just go like this. <laughs> you know, I, I turn my head, look over the wall. I'm not, I can't see anything, but it's got to make that guy uncomfortable. <laughs> nice watch. <laughs> yeah, that's, oh my God. I, <laughs> too funny. Oh my gosh. All right. So you've got the fudge company. You're running you know, world-class race foot races, you're buying short-term rentals and Airbnbs and, and burrs and all this other stuff. I'm, I'm curious, like, I know you like a challenge and you know, you mentioned at one point that you were kind of feeling sorry for yourself at one point when all this went down, but I'm curious, like what, aside from just liking a challenge and being resilient, how did you come back so strong from not just losing your sight, but losing your hearing? I mean, that's, that's a, you know, a one, two combo, not an easy thing to deal with. And there's a lot of people who would just take it and just kind of be like, okay, well now I'm going to sit around and instead you're dominating three different industries. You know, I just had a great conversation on my show with a guy who's got a podcast dedicated to gratitude mm. and it was, it was one of the best, I mean, this is a great introspective question and how, how do we do it? And, and part of it is, you know, it's a lot of gratitude for what I have and what I'm still able to do and who I've got around me. And, you know, the lessons I can learn from these experiences, you know, uh, uh, bad water is really hard and it's painful and it's hot and it's really like, pretty, it's uncomfortable. Um, and 
you know, when, when you come to like a, your, your, your regular, your marrow, 26.2 miles, you know, there's a, there's a common saying that, uh, once you get to 20 miles, you're halfway there. Meaning being that you get past the physical part to that other half, which is the mental part and something like bad water or in other ultras, you know, you get, you have this, this, this hard shit, you get this physical discomfort, this physical pain. Um, and you got to get through that to get to the mental part. And that's when those voices in the back of your mind say, this is too hard. This is too difficult. You're not prepared. You can't do this. And if you, you weren't afraid to face that, that voice, you know, to, 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 to get to that, that mental part, then you know, it, 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 it takes daily practice. And, and when I, either the voice was in my head, it came to my head. I, I remember the moment in a bad water, um, there's a, there's a part of the section called father crawling. And there's these switchbacks going up a steep, the second mountain climb and it's super hot. My balance is all over the place. I think I'm going to cross that, that white lane and right and just eat a Volvo's grill, you know? And, and I was, I was so frustrated and pissed off. And that voice was ringing in my ear. You have to quit. And, and it, it, but that's when you, you say, you know what, this is why I came here. You kind of get, you put a grin on your face and you say, I've been, I've been expecting you. Mm -hmm. no. And I do have it in me. I can do this and I can figure it out. And, and that's what all of this is, you know, the, the, the facing the challenges, seeing what I can do, seeing what I can't do, learning from what, from learning my, from my failures. And I've had lots of failures, lots of, them. you know, we're, we're, we're looking at our wounds from a couple, uh, rehab jobs in Pensacola right now. Oh my gosh. The contractor, you know, this is one of those nightmare contractors, but we just, we just, we got screwed uh, and we're figuring, we're, we're adjusting, uh, we're learning, we're fixing, we're, we're, uh, patching those holes in the, the property and our processes. Yeah. I like that you pointed out that you've had your fair share of failures in there because, you know, I think that's just good, good perspective because everybody does, but man, gratitude, you are, you are right, right about that for sure. Uh, that's one of the things like in the planner that I created, you know, one of the things you do at the beginning of every day is you write out three things you're grateful for. And I can tell a difference in the tone of my day if I don't <clears throat> do that. Uh, or if I don't do the planner at all, that throws my whole day off. But if I don't spend a little time thinking about what I'm grateful for and showing some gratitude for what's going on in life, it's like a noticeable difference in my mood. Um, you know what, besides just your mood, you're absolutely right. But it, it, it changes the whole perspective in your day. Uh, and also it's a habit. It's a practice. It's, mm -hmm. it's a skill that. You, you have to develop over time. I mean, gratitude is, is an action, right? Not just yeah. a feeling. And, um, you develop this, this habit of gratitude. Like you were talking about, you know, writing down things you're grateful for every single day, you know, two or three things every single day. And you know what, after a while you have to get pretty creative because you run out of family and dogs, you know, <laughs> and, and flavors of bourbon. I mean, like it just. Uh, so you gotta, you, you really gotta think about things in this world that you're grateful for. Like that time I got to stand on top of uh, the Eiffel tower or, you know, you know, the, the, I'm grateful that I got to be there for my son's first birthday and actually see him and my whole family for that, that, that last picture in my, my photo album up in my head. Mm -hmm. and so I, these are things that I'm grateful for every single day, but it, you got to stop and really meditate on it. And that, what it does is not only are you grateful, but then you also, it, it, it builds your humility It builds upon your creativity and it really opens you up for learning 
and growing and you know that that growth mindset it's yeah it's it really is the seed to a, you know, a great great day and a great life is being grateful yeah i agree i love that and that's i think a really it, it's funny because it's it's such a simple piece of advice for people going through a hard time but it when you're in the middle of a hard time it's not so simple like that's not that is not what you want to think about most of the time. When you're, when you're in a, a tough situation, you're not like, oh, let me think about what I'm grateful for. That's not natural. So like you said, it's a forced, it's a, an action that you have to form into a habit so that when things are going not your way, you can still sit back and go, you know what? But I've got all this stuff and I've got a pretty good life. And it puts a lot of stuff in perspective. It's not easy. But it's powerful. It's it's not. I mean, you, especially. But that's when it's most needed, right? Yeah. It's it's when, um, you know, that's like uh, Jocko Willock and the discipline equals freedom. And um, it's it's easy to be grateful. It's it's easy to be grateful when you're, uh, you know, in a good mood and right? when things are going for you. But it's most necessary the discipline of most things in life, like getting up on time, going to work, you know, uh, bathing. You know, know. these basic necessities, it's easy to be disciplined when you want to, but, you know, sleeping in when you're feeling miserable feels like the right thing to do, but it's not. And um, the act, the practice of gratitude, uh, it's most beneficial when you don't want to do your homework, right? You know, when you don't want to do that, you know, write out that list. That's when you got to tell yourself, this is when I need to. I agree. That's, that's great advice. So Aaron, I feel like we've covered a lot, but I also know that you have a lot going on. So before we wrap this up, is there anything we've missed that we should talk about? Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, we, let's see, we're, we're, we're always looking for people to partner with, you know, do, doing, you know, business here in Pensacola or in the panhandle of Florida um, in uh, Ohio, in Akron, Ohio. Uh, we're always looking for private money lenders or contractors or joint venture partners, wholesalers. And, and I'm always looking for people that have a great story to tell about living their best life and leveling up on my podcast. Yeah. Pull it, pull it a bit back with Aaron here. Yeah. And it's a good show. I've listened to a few of your episodes, which is saying something because I don't listen to very many podcasts anymore. I, I don't have time to keep up on them, but, uh, I'm flattered. But yeah, man, your, your show is, is, you know, it's, it's interesting. So I listened to one where you, you started talking about sleep. And how much that had changed for you. And I was like, bam, I had never thought about uh, not to derail and get on a whole huge rabbit trail, but like, I'd never thought about the impact that going blind would have on your ability to sleep in a normal sleep cycle. And it was very eye opening. Yeah. Well, that's funny. Uh, the added bonus of losing your eyesight is the fact that you can't reset your internal clock. So, you know, that circadian rhythm. Uh, so I don't know. Sometimes but I feel like it's the middle of the night in the middle of the day and vice versa. And then, of course, no, I told you about the added bonus of going deaf is I uh, also lost my balance. So yeah. um, pretty, pretty much senseless. Um, and, although, my, of course, as you can tell, my sense of humor is sharper than ever. <laughs> it is. Yes, it is. And the thing that I love about that side is, you know, it's funny. So, uh, you know, it's interesting. People seem to get, I don't want to say insecure, but maybe uncomfortable sometimes around people who have a disability. They're like, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to, like, is it okay? Like, do I want to acknowledge, you know, there's like this weird kind of like thing that goes through people's heads sometimes. And the thing that I love about your sense of humor is that you immediately break that barrier with anybody you meet because you make jokes like about the fact that you're blind or, you know, that you're, 
uh, about the situation. So people immediately are like, oh, okay, like this is a totally comfortable thing. We can like, it's there, it's out in the open, like it's not an elephant in the room. And it makes people very comfortable around you, which is- Half the time, half the time is just a complaint and camouflage. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but there, you, you, the camouflage is good because you get people laughing and people like you. And uh, in fact, I don't know that I've met a person yet who <laughs> who hasn't been a big fan of Aaron Hale. I know I'm in Aaron Hale's camp, so. Uh, well, thank you. And you know what? Um, it's that is um, to pull back the the curtain a little bit. It is uh, it's, it's a survivor skill. Uh, yeah, I've I've had because I. <laughs> of a very limited input I had to develop my output a little bit better uh, communication skills empathy uh humor yeah. all of that so that um i can make myself more approachable because of course you walk past me crowd i am not going to recognize you but um but also it's about team building skills everything in my life is a team sport yeah and everything in your life should be a team sport too. I'm an advocate for this, not just because it's a necessity for me, but uh, it should be a necess necessity for everybody else. You know, we can't, it's like building these businesses, growing these businesses, I just, it wouldn't have been possible on my own. So I've had to gather people that have the, the right skills, the right abilities, the right knowledge around me that can do it better than me. And even if they don't do it better than, you know, particular things better than me, at least I don't have to do it all. And that's fine. And, you know, we need, we are, we're social creatures. We need to be around that. So, yeah. Uh, but since humor is a, is, is a great tool in team building and relationship, you know, building. Yeah. And, you know, the, the science behind laughter is, is good. Laughter's really 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 good for your soul and and even your physical body uh you know it's it's a good thing good medicine it is yeah that's what they say so aaron where can people get a hold of you if they'd like to reach out if they want to partner with you or listen to your your podcast i know it's the point of impact with aaron hale but what's the is that where you want people to connect or what's the best way to connect with you absolutely i want them to go check out the podcast point of impact uh with aaron hale that's and point of impact pod.com they can Email me with uh, any questions they might have at uh, Aaron at Aaron. No, no, I'm sorry, Aaron Hale Podcast at gmail.com. Of course, if you want some delicious treats or really cool tactical apron and some other gear, eodfudge.com. Absolutely. And we will have links to all of that in the show notes for sure. And I'm I'm pretty stoked about. Um, uh, just having you back on the show, man, this is, this has been fun. It's, it's cool to, well, it's, it's good. It's, you know what it is, it is, it's cool to have been your friend for the last few years, but it's also just really cool to see your progress over that time. I mean, it's, it's always fun when you get to see, like kind of follow along on someone's journey. I could say the same, but back at you, my man, you know, uh, you've been doing some incredible work, you've been growing just this community, this movement of education and collaboration. And you know what? A lot of my success is based uh, on the network you've created and the education you put out. So we talked about gratitude, and I'm extremely gratitude. Great, I'm a gratitude for you. Uh, <laughs> I'm grateful for you, my friend. You too, good sir. Always a pleasure, Aaron. And ladies and gentlemen, the great Aaron Hale. <laughs> I think that's gonna be that's gonna be my new sign off. That sounds good. Aaron, thanks so much for joining us today, brother. Thanks for having me, my man.